but it's mostly the concept that I want to bring out. Our Torah portion uh, begins with journey, uh, Genesis 37, 1 and 2, and it is called Vayashev, which means he dwelt. And it talks about how Jacob dwelt in a land wherein his father was a stranger. Who was his father? Who was Jacob's father? How long did Isaac live? 180 years. Okay, now wait a minute. His dad <laughs> lived in a land where he was a stranger for 180 years? Who was Isaac's dad? Abraham. And when did Abraham receive the promise? How old was he? He was 75 when he received the promise of the land. He was... That's when he moved there. And how long did Abraham live to be? 175. So here, Abraham, grandpa, was in this land for 100 years. His dad was in there 180 years for a total of almost 300 years. And Jacob is well over 100, 400 years. And it's a land where they were considered strangers. And yet God promised them that land. I've always thought that was very interesting. But here's something that I want. Oh, yeah, come ahead. Yeah, got some hot tea and honey. Ooh, good. Thank you. Ah, much better. Okay. Here's something I want to bring out that just really hit me this morning hard, and, and that's why it's not on uh, in your notes. But everyone knows that this story begins with... Uh, the generations of Jacob, and it starts with Joseph, who's only 17 years old. And it talks about the story of Joseph. Do you realize the first mention of human trafficking is right here? The very first mention of human trafficking that is recorded in history is right here. Now, here's the verses I gave, uh, I have here. First off, let me ask you this. Were the Joseph's brothers guilty of selling him into Egypt? Absolutely not. The Joseph's brothers had nothing to do with selling him into Egypt. Let's start with Genesis 37, 27, which isn't on your notes, but just write it down on your notes. Now, here's what the brothers did say. They say, hey, come let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and don't let our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, and his brother were happy with selling him to the Ishmaelites. But what happened? In the next verse, it says, then they're passed by Midianites. So there's Ishmaelites that are going along, and they say, hey, let's sell them to the Ishmaelites. But what happens, the Midianites are coming along, and the Midianites are the one who drew Joseph out of the pit, and they're the ones who sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites. And the Ishmaelites are the ones who sold him into Egypt. So the, uh, we see here, it says, Then there passed by Midianite merchant men, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites. And they brought him to Egypt. Okay. So who sold Joseph to Egypt? The Ishmaelites. But listen to this in Genesis 37, 36. It says, and the Midianites sold him into Egypt. Right? Well, well now wait a minute. And, and then we see in Genesis 39, 1, Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer, Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites. What is that telling us? How come one verse says it's the Midianites who sold them and another verse says that it was the Ishmaelites who sold them? This is not an error. It's telling you that the Midianites were guilty of selling them into Egypt just like the brothers were guilty of selling them into Egypt even though they never actually were the ones that did it. The reason why they're guilty is because they had the intent and the Midianites are even saying that they sold him into Egypt when they actually sold him to the Ishmaelites who sold him into Egypt because they are guilty also of the intent. So think about this for a minute. Since 
Judah never, or the brothers never sold them, him into Egypt. Why are they accountable and feel guilty? It's because of their intent. Where does God look at? Our intent. Your intent even makes you guilty before God, even though you don't carry out the actions. All too often we feel, I'm only guilty if I carry out the actions, but that's not true. God is telling us right here, we are guilty even of the intent of our heart, which is why we're all sinners. Okay? How many of you would like to strangle somebody sometime? Okay. This is why in Genesis 42, 21, they said to one another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother. This is when they're about to reveal himself to Joseph. Okay, now, let me go here. I want to talk about the human trafficking situation for a second. Today, do you know there was a news article that just the other day, archaeologists unearthed the most shocking example of Roman slavery at Pompeii. The archaeologists, they ended up uncovering a cramped bakery with barred windows believed to be where enslaved people were forced to work. So you see they're grinding bread. They have these endless circle going around. Well, here's what the article stated. There was a bakery where enslaved people were imprisoned and exploited to produce bread has been discovered in the ruins of Pompeii. And what has been described as the most shocking example of slavery in the ancient Roman city. The discovery provides more evidence on the daily life of Pompeii's enslaved people, often forgotten about by historical sources, but who made up most of the population and whose hard labor is what propped up the city's economy. It's always about the money, guys, as well as the culture and fabric of Roman civilization. There were markings that were used to coordinate the movement of enslaved workers and blindfolded animals were found on the bakery's floor. The home was divided into a residential part that was adorned with lavish frescoes. And then there was the bakery where the enslaved people were forced to grind the grain needed to produce the bread. And the bakery was cut off from the outside world with only exit leading to the main hall of the house. And then they were barred. And how did God judge the human trafficking situation? Pompeii. Now, I'm going to explain something to you. Right here is what is known as the Texas Triangle. It involves Houston, San Antonio, and Dallas. They are the number one human trafficking area in the entire United States. Isn't that crazy? Let me see. Listen to this. The black market driven criminal industry of human trafficking is grounded on the simple economics of demand and supply. The only reason it's human trafficking is because people in America and all over the world want it. Why do you think they want all the immigrants coming up here? Now, the human trafficking right now brings in an estimated $150 billion in profits annually. $150 billion. Human trafficking crime exists only because there is ample demand for the criminal offense. Known as part of the Texas Triangle, connecting Houston, San Antonio, and Dallas, Houston has the highest rate of human trafficking in the United States. These three major cities connect together through major interstates where people move in large numbers and human trafficking is seemingly easier. There's the CAC, which is the Children's Assessment Center. They note, get a load of this. See this? How many of you ever heard of Starbucks? In Houston alone, there's 158 Starbucks. But even the governor of Texas said there are more brothels in Houston than there are Starbucks.
Now, if you remember, and this is why I'm writing my book, next year, on April 2008, look where the solar eclipse is going. It is going directly through this area because God is going to judge the human trafficking situation here in the United States. Okay? And in case you didn't know, this happens, this eclipse happens on the same day the plague of three days of darkness in Egypt happened. The very same day. Now, Here's the United States. How many of you know we have the 2024 elections coming up next year? How many of you expect any kind of chaos? Well, let me break it down. There's going to be political chaos, just like the January 6th thing. You're going to have the right against the left and marching, and it's going to be major chaos next year because of the elections. But not only that, and I have the fuse burning right there. The fuse has already been lit, guys. Well, guess what else? There's also going to be ethnic trouble. Just like you have the white supremacists, the Black Lives Matter, and it's just going to be a matter in the Bible, in Matthew 24, where it says nation will rise against nation. That is not correct translation. It's ethnic group is going to rise against ethnic group. And that fuse has already been lit. Well, then we also have the anti-Semitism that's going on right now between the Jews and the non-Jews and the Palestinians. That is another huge battle, and that fuse has already been lit. I also believe this next year, we're going to see terrorist attacks in the United States. I really believe it. Uh, I, I'm seeing that there's gonna be people. Can you imagine what this would do to our economy? If someone, if there was a suicide bomber at a gas station or a suicide bomber in the aisle of a grocery store, Everyone will be afraid to go to the grocery store. They'll be afraid to go to the gas station. They'll be looking over their shoulder constantly. Who is next to me? They're, they're almost, and they haven't decided it yet, but I, it's, it happened just the other day. But I also believe you could see a terrorist bomber blow himself up on a bridge. And you're not, when you're driving, can you imagine what that's going to do to car insurance rates, truck insurance rates? If that's, I mean, it's going to go through the roof if there's terrorist attacks all over the United States. Well, how about the China situation? Attacking Taiwan or wanting to attack us. There's a fuse. Then we also have Russia. We've got that fuse that's already going. Well, guess what? I believe God's judgment is coming and we could end up having a super volcano go off. We could end up having a, a major earthquake happen. But it's like, this is crazy. But this is why I wrote this book, America at War in 2024. All these fuses have been lit. I'm not prophesying. I'm just telling people what the patterns look like. Can you imagine next year with all the civil unrest, we end up with a civil war, terrorist attacks inside, and an external war being attacked by another country all at the same time? 2024, Looking at the, all the fuses that are lit looks to be where we need to get ready uh, in, in many ways. Uh, and people ask me, how do you get prepared? Well, how do you prepare for a tsunami? Okay, I, I mean, all I can say is what we gotta do, and I'm telling you right now, we gotta get close to God. It all comes down to our relationship. Uh, it, it really does, which is why I encourage people to heed this warning uh, because this is what I see coming. L listen to Revelation chapter, I mean, does the Bible say there's going to be wars and rumors of wars? Okay, listen to Revelation 18. This is my last verse that's extra. Verse 11 through 13. This is Revelation. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over Babylon, because no one buys their merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones, pearls, beasts, sheep, horses, chariots, and slaves, and the souls of men. I cut out a bunch of all the other things they said, but I want you to realize God's judgment is coming in particularly because of the slaves and the souls of men, the human sex trafficking, everything that's going on. Well, guess what? The demand for human trafficking is huge here in the United States. That's why God's going to judge us. Now for the good news. Okay. We'll start with Genesis 37. 
And one and two, Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding his flock with his brothers. And he was a lad and he was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. This means both Rachel and Leah are dead. Okay, it's just uh, the other concubines who have now become wives. And Joseph went to his father and said, these guys are bad, okay? So here's the thing. Look at Hebrews 11:9. also, when it comes to a land where in he's a stranger. It says, by faith, Abraham sojourned in the land of promise as if it was a, what kind of a country? A strange country. In tabernacles, having dwelt with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Now look at Exodus 12, 41. 40 and 41 for a minute. Here it says, now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwell in Egypt was 430 years. Okay, so how long were they in Egypt? How long were they in Egypt? Okay, well, a lot of people say, well, it says 430 years. No, it does not. Listen, again, I'm gonna read it a little bit differently. The sojourning of the children of Israel, you know those guys who had dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. That means they, not, they weren't in Egypt 430 years. They were dwelling in strange countries for 430 years, which goes back to Isaac was considered to be in a strange country. It doesn't say they were all in Egypt. And now look at this. It came to pass at the end of the 430 years even the very same day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So let's take a look at what happened. <clears throat> what year was Abraham born? Do you remember? 1948, isn't that amazing? And he was 75 years old when he received the promise. And that's why 1948 and 75 is 2023. Okay, so Abraham enters the promised land and did you know, it doesn't say, but we know he entered it on Passover. How do we know? It just said 430 years earlier on the self same day. It's referring the 430 years goes to the promise was given to Abraham to when they left Egypt was the 430 years. And they both happened on Passover. We know uh, from Adam and Eve, Abraham was born in 1948. We know in 2023 at 75 years old, he received the promise. We also know that Jacob enters Egypt at 130 years old in the year, drum roll, 2238, and 215 years had gone by. And then we see 215 years after that in the year 2453 from Adam, that's when they leave. And if you take the 2453 minus 2023, you get the 430 years. We know Moses left Egypt on Passover in the year 2453, and Shazam, can you believe it? From the very day Abraham receives the promise on Passover to the very day is the same day that Moses leaves. This shows you God's hand in control of all of this. Now, as a reminder, <clears throat> the year uh, Anno Mundi is AM, think of Adam made, but it means the year of the world since creation. Let's we'll put Adam and Eve at year one, okay? When you look at Genesis and the begats, you know that Adam was 130 years old when he fathered Seth, and then he fathered Enosh. And you can go through and look at all of the begats, clear down, there's the flood, okay? And then finally you get to Abraham. Uh, and it's just math, it's simple, 1948. So we know in 2023 that he received the promise. Now here's what's amazing. Here we have Adam and Eve and uh, we know that uh, from Genesis 5 and 11, Abraham was born in 1948. And we know he was 75 years old in Genesis 12, 1 through 4, okay, which was 2023. And then 430 years later in Exodus 12, uh, we see this is when Moses left in 2453. And then look at 1 Kings 6, 1. Read it there. It says that it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign in the month of Ziph, uh, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. 
So we literally mathematically can pinpoint the year from Adam all the way to when the foundation of the temple was laid by simple Bible verses. So that would have been the year 2933. And then we read that it took seven years to build in 1 Kings uh, 638, but then he waited, which was the 2940, but that was also a Shemitah year. Well, guess what? He waits another year to dedicate it. And so it was in that year that the fire fell from heaven. Well, when you read, you'll see Hashvan, the second month is when it was completed. And he waited all the way another 11 months to Tishri to dedicate it. Why? Because 2940 is a Shemitah year. It's also divisible by 49, which means the temple was dedicated in the year of Jubilee in 2941. Okay, which again is the first year of a Shemitah cycle. All right, so now, I just showed you when the temple was built, and you can go back and see that David was crowned king in the year 2889, and then there you see where the foundation of the temple was laid, when it was dedicated, as we just saw in 2941, and then you go to all the kings of Judah, and you see at the, the very end, it was in the year 3361 from Adam that the temple was destroyed. It's, it's, you can actually know exactly everything. Uh, I have a chart of every Shemitah year, every Jubilee year, all the way back to creation. But here's your 430 years. The first 215 years, we see the promise was made to Abraham, and that was a Shemitah year. And then we see uh, Isaac is born uh, 100 years later. Uh, Jacob was born to Isaac. Abraham dies Isaac ends up dying, which is where we're pretty much at now in the year 2228. So Jacob is 130 when he enters uh, Egypt. And here you see it's exactly 215 years. Then uh, what do we see? Look at this for a minute. Here's the different ages of all the kids. Joseph was 39 years old when his brethren entered Egypt. And notice Levi was 45 and this is all simple math. So when you look at the second 215 years, you can see the age of Joseph. You can see the age of Levi. You see in 2309, that's when Joseph has been in Egypt 93 years, and he dies at 110. Levi lived the longest of all of the children of Israel, uh, and he died at 137 years old. And then if you go to the very end, we know Moses was 80 years old when he left. So he subtract 80 years and you see Moses was born in the year 2373. So it's all simple math. You can find out exactly when all these events happened. Now, here we are. This is Shechem, also known biblically as Shechem. And this is the picture I took when I was uh, up in Itamar at the three seas it's called because you can see the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And what are these two hills on either side? Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. This is where the Jews got on different sides and yelled the curses and yelled the promises and all of that. And what's that city right there in the middle? Shechem. This is where Joseph is buried. I've been there. This is a picture I took of Joseph's tomb. It's that round dome thing right there. You can't go down there or you're dead, but you could be up on a hill taking a picture. So uh, that's about as close as I wanted to get. But that's what it... Uh, look like. Okay, so what do we find here? In Genesis 37, 12, it says his brothers went to feed their, now they're in Hebron. And so from Hebron, the, Jacob sends his sons to go feed the father's flock in Shechem. What do we know about Shechem? This is where the brothers just got done killing everybody. Okay, it's a dangerous place now. But that's where they go. And then Genesis 37, 13, Israel tells Joseph, hey, don't your brothers feed the flock in Shechem? Hey, I'm going to send you to them. If I was Joseph, I'd say, heck no, I ain't going there. Are you crazy? But he said, okay, I'm going. So what's fascinating, listen, here we have the father sending his son to his brothers, like the father sends Yeshua to his brother who willingly then goes to seek them out all the way to a place called Dothan. And who did not receive him? His brothers didn't receive him. So what did they do? They turned him over to the Gentiles. Doesn't this sound familiar? Okay, 
to be done with as they chose. Now, Shechem is 50 miles away from Hebron. This is quite a ways he's sending them. It's not like around the corner. So you can also see the concern Jacob had for his other sons returning to that area where they just got done killing a whole bunch of Shechemites. All right. But Shechem is also the same place where Abraham built the very first altar when he entered the promised land. Now, here's the other thing. In the Torah, there is a hint that a prophecy is about to begin. And you only see this in Hebrew. You don't see it in English. But where it says he sent him to take care of the flock, I want you to notice I have it in Hebrew. Uh, uh, Thon is the word for flock. But right before it is the Aleph Tav. And look at the Aleph Tav. There are two pierce marks above the Aleph Tav. Now, I find that uh, very fascinating, uh, referring to Yeshua as the Aleph Tav, who had two pierced hands, and he goes to check on his flock. But now listen to Genesis 37, 15 through 17. It says, a certain man found him. When it says a certain man, and doesn't tell you who it is, this tells you it's probably an angelic visitor. Okay, it's not just any old man. It was a certain man. And behold, here he was wandering in the field. Just like all of us sinners. We're out there wandering. And he said, what are you looking for? And Joseph said, well, I'm looking for my brothers. Tell me, please, where they are feeding the flock. And the man said, well, they've left here. And I heard him say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them where? In Dothan. Well, get a load of this. Dothan only appears twice in the Bible. All right? It appears, or one other place in the Bible. It appears twice in this verse and then only one other time. Well, let me show you Dothan here. You see, you can look at the map. They were started in Hebron and they went all the way to Shechem and then Joseph goes to Dothan, all right? And then he ends up getting sold to Egypt. Now, you don't see this in English. You only see it in Hebrew, okay? Uh, dot, the dalet tav at the top, basically can mean religion, okay? Which is part of Dothan. But I want you to see here, uh, here it says uh, in the English, uh, the Lord came from Sinai, rose up from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with holy tens of thousands from his right hand when a fiery law. Well, the word law is dot, okay? The Dalet Tav means law or religious decrees. Okay, with that said, let's go back to the map, all right? In Hebrew, dot means a law or a decree. But in Persian, it refer it is referring to man-made laws. And in the Chaldean language, it refers to a well or a fountain. All right, now here's Dothan or Dothan, the Dalet Tav with the final noon. But look at this. And again, you're never going to see this in English. But here in Genesis 37, 17, where he says they were in Dothan. Well, here's the other place in 2 Kings 6, 13. This is where the enemy is so upset because there's a prophet in Israel that tells the king everything that the enemy is doing. And it says in verse 13, he said, go and spy where this guy is and I can send and bring him. And it was told him saying, behold, he is where? In Dothan. All right. Now, what you see at the top is the last time Dothan is used but look at this. Here's the other place it is used. See it right there? And up here, it's spelled differently. I don't know if you knew this, but God intentionally misspells words in the Torah. But the English corrects them all as if we think we could be God's editor and we don't realize God is purposely misspelling words so that we, have, we should know something is going on. Okay, so here's Doton, but here's the other Doton. And what do we know has been added? The yud hey of the yud hey vav hey of God. And this is where a, a real miracle takes place. Listen to 2 Kings 6. I have a couple of the verses here. Uh, and it says, at that time, the king of Aram was making war against Israel. 
Then he said, go and see where he is that I can send and get him. And news came to him that Elisha was in Dothan. You know, and so it's fascinating that here the miracle worker Elisha is in the same place where a certain man ends up running into Joseph. Okay, so now we come to the pit. All right, in Genesis 37, 18 through 20, it says, when Joseph's brother saw him far off, even before he came near, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said one to another, behold, this dreamer's coming. Come now, let us slay him, cast him into this pit, and we'll say, oh, some evil beast devoured him, and we shall see what I will, and what will become of his dreams. Okay, well, like I said, look at this. <clears throat> Genesis 37, 23 and 24 came to pass. When Joseph came to his brother, they stripped him out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water. Now, why in the world would they say there was no water? They already said the pit was empty. You know, what's the point? Well, that's a whole nother cool thing to look at. But look at Genesis 37, 25. It says, they sat down to eat bread. They lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spice tree and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. Where were the brothers? Okay, well, here we see on the little picture that they stripped him of his coat, they threw him in the pit, and there he is screaming, get me out of here. Well, over here, the brothers decide to have a picnic on the other side of the hill out of his earshot. They don't want to hear him whining and complaining, so they say, let's have our picnic. While they're having a picnic on one side of the hill, here comes the Ishmaelites, and they say, let's sell them to the Ishmaelites. Unbeknownst to them, the Midianites come, and they go by, and they take them out of the pit. And then the Ishmaelites go on their merry way, and the, uh, the Midianites have sold them to the Ishmaelites. So then what happens? Reuben comes, and he sees he's not there. All they see is his multicolored coat. And he goes, what are we going to do now? And so we see that the brothers never did sell them. The Midianites sold them, but they still are guilty. Okay. Now, here we see in Genesis 37, 28, some traders from Midian went by. They're the ones who pulled Joseph up out of the hole and they gave him to the Ishmaelites for 20 bits of silver and then they took him to Egypt. Well, I think it's fascinating in Matthew 20, verse 18 and 19, Yeshua says, behold, we're going up to Jerusalem and the son of man is gonna be betrayed to the chief priests, to the scribes, and they're gonna condemn him to death. But what are they gonna do? They're gonna deliver him over to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are the ones who are going to mock him and scourge him and crucify him. Okay, so what is that telling us? Both Jews and Gentiles are responsible for the death of the Messiah. You can't just say it's those Jews who killed my Jesus. All right, now, Genesis 37, 29 and 30. Reuben comes back to the hole. Joseph wasn't there. And giving signs of grief, he goes back to his brothers and he said, he's gone. What are we going to do? Well, this is why intent is so important. The brothers thought he was still in the pit. The brothers had left him to die. They had no idea he'd already been sold, but they're guilty because of the intent. And we see in Genesis 37, 36, the Midianites are the one who sold him into Egypt to Potiphar. All right, well, how much time do I have? I've got a little bit, okay. Now, let's look at Genesis 39, 1. Joseph was brought down to Egypt and it was Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian brought him from the hands of the Ishmaelites. So we see that Israel, Joseph's brothers were responsible. The Midianites were responsible. Everyone was responsible for selling him to Egypt. You can't say, well, I didn't, okay, because your intent was there. Now, Genesis 39.1 clarifies Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of uh, Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites. Okay, so we see that is ultimately who they bought him from. But what do we see in Genesis 37, 31 and 32? They took Joseph's coat and they killed a kid of the goats and they dipped the coat in blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, this we have found. Know now whether it is your son's coat or not. Well, you don't see this in English. You only see it in Hebrew. But that word know now is hakernah. Na means please, 
and recognize to what he's saying. Would you please recognize and um, look at Genesis. Oh, here it is. Let me put it up here. Okay, haker na. It means, would you please recognize this? Well, in Genesis, uh, let me see if I'm, oh, let me see. Okay, uh, okay, good. I'm going to get there. All right, so now, just remember haker na, which means recognize, please. And then what do we see uh, happened in Genesis 37, 33? And he saw that it was, and he said, it is my son's coat, an evil beast must have put him to death. And without doubt, Joseph has come to a cruel end. Okay, Joseph was then missing for 22 years. That's how long he was missing. And Isaac dies just before the first year of the seven years of plenty. Uh, you know, so it was like three years later, the rest of Jacob and the brothers go into uh, Egypt. But poor Isaac also suffered thinking that his uh, grandson uh, had been killed. And so what do we see? There's a, this next chapter 38 is like a huge out of place text because chapter 39 picks it up where chapter 37 ends. But we're now seeing what happens to Judah. In Genesis 38, one, it says, at that time, Judah went down from his brothers and he turned into a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira, and Judah saw there a daughter of a certain, not just any Canaanite, a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into her. Oh my goodness, the last thing they're supposed to do is marry the Canaanites. They should have known that from Noah's flood and everything else because they're cursed. Okay, so the reason this is put in there is because Joseph's physical descent into Egypt is paralleling with Judah's moral descent into depravity. During the separation, Judah's oldest son dies, okay? And he knows firsthand now how his father feels and what it means to mourn for the loss of one's own child. And then Judah's second son dies, and then his wife dies. So all of a sudden, Judah has a little reality check and he realized what it means to mourn the loss of a child. Okay, so let me see. Uh, There's calamity after calamity and the whole story of Judah marrying a Canaanite, his two young sons dying, as well as his wife's death, all happens within 22 years of the sale of Joseph. Okay, well, Judah was 22 years old when Joseph was sold. And now he's 44 when he's entering Egypt. This next text is particularly profound as it is the beginning of the story of Joseph, which begins the story at every Passover of the redemption process, okay? And the Messiah's work. It is in Shechem where the story of Passover begins with the sale of Joseph, believe it or not. And that's the place where Joseph is buried today. And we see in Genesis, oh, let me go here. Okay, so... Isaac dies at 180 years old. So Jacob would have been 120. Joseph was 29 when he died or when Isaac died, <clears throat> but Joseph was sold at 17. So Isaac even mourned Joseph's supposed death for 12 years, never knowing he was actually still alive. Now here I have a little chart and this is more of a year by year. We see that Isaac was 172 in the year 22, 20 a.m. Isaac was 172. Uh, or Jacob was 112. And then you go all the way and you see in 2224, uh, Benjamin is 16 years old at this time. And on the seventh column, Isaac is 178 years old. It's the year 2226. And this is where the baker dies. And the baker literally dies on Rosh Hashanah. This is huge. Okay. And then look, the next uh, column In the year 2227, Jacob is 119 years. Joseph is 28 while he's in prison. And then the very next year when Isaac is 180, Isaac dies. Jacob is 120. Joseph is 29. And then look at this. Joseph is 30 years old. And when did Yeshua begin his ministry? 30 years old. And Joseph is released on Rosh Hashanah. This is incredible. 
Okay, and then Jacob is 121, the seven years of prosperity begin. Then you see Manasseh is born, Ephraim is born, Ur is possibly about 15. And then look at this next one. In the year 2233, this is when uh, Tamar marries Ur, who is now 16. That's how old you have to be to get married, basically. And then Ur dies. And then Onan, uh, who is about 15, he turns 16, he marries she marries him, and then he dies. And then Shelah is possibly 14 years old. And Judah says, let's wait till he's 16, okay? But here's the thing with Ur. Here is Ur. When you turn it around, it's evil. And this is why God took him, because Ur in a mirror would be evil, that same word. Okay, and it says in Genesis 38, 7, that Judah's first son did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so he put him to death. In Genesis 38, 11, it says, then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, okay, you remain a widow in your father's house until Shelah, my son, has grown up. For he said, lest, for he was worried that he might also die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. Now, in Genesis 38, 13, and 14, what do we see? It was told Tamar, hey, behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And so she put her widow's garments off and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place. In Hebrew, that word for open place means a real eye opener. This is something that is a very interesting place because she had saw that Shelah was grown and she wasn't given to him for rife. Uh, The Leverite marriage gave the widow economic security. So Tamar sits in the roadway at an open place and the Hebrew calls it petah and naim, which literally means an eye-opener. And so what do we see in Genesis 38, 15 through 17? Judah Caesar thought her, she was a harlot. That shows you how far Judah has descended morally. And because she had covered her face, and he turned to her by the way and said, go, I pray you, let me come to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, what are you going to give me that you may come into me? And he said, well, I'll send you a kid from the flock. And she said, will you give me a pledge till you send it? Well, guess what? Just as Jacob fooled his father Isaac to get the blessing by a goat pretending to be Esau, Judah is fooled by Jacob by the means of a goat about the death of Joseph. So Judah is now bamboozled by Tamar by the means of a goat. Okay, they got his goat. Okay, now let's look at Genesis 38, 24, and 25. It came to pass about three months later, Tamar looks pregnant. And they say, your daughter-in-law has played the harlot. And also behold, she is with child by prostitution. And Judah said, bring her and let her, bring her here and let her be burnt. And when she was brought forth, she said to her father-in-law saying, by the man whose deeds are, I am with child. And she said, hakar na. <laughs> the very same thing Judah said to Joseph, Haker na. Now Tamar says it to Judah, Haker na. Recognize this. Okay? And this is a payback time. That phrase, discern or Haker na, please recognize in Hebrew. And it appears only twice in all of Scripture. And these two unique instances both appear right here and just 30 verses earlier. Judah used the same words. Judah understood that because he caused his father pain with those words, that identical phrase is used to cause him the pain of public embarrassment. Measure for measure. And so we'll close with this verse in Genesis 39, 19, and 20. Okay, it says, And hearing his wife's account of what his servant had done, you know, uh, she accused Joseph of raping her, okay? And it says here, he became very angry. And Joseph's master took him and put him in prison in the place where the king's prisoners were kept in chains. And he was there in the prison house. Well, do you want to know what? For doing that to the king's wife, that's pretty mild punishment. He should have been killed. This tells you the king suspected his wife. All right, that is what this is telling you. Uh, considering that he cut off the baker's head for no reason and never even asked Joseph uh, his version of the story. All right, we're done.
But this part, let's stand. We'll pray. We'll take a little break and then have some worship. And then you got to put up with the second half. Avino Mulcano, a father king, we just thank you so much for uh, your word. God, you truly look at the intents of our heart. And I just pray, Father, that all of us really are naked and open before you. And Father, I just pray that you would speak to all of our hearts, that all of us would just humble ourselves. Father, we know what's coming this next year, total chaos, and we need to get ready now. So Father, I just pray you would touch people's hearts. Lord, uh, just bring us all closer together. I, I pray for all those who help support your ministry right here at El Shaddai from around the world locally and around the United States. We want to be a light to the nations. Uh, the world is only getting darker, uh, and, but it's always darkest just before dawn. And I just pray each one of us would be a light of your Torah to all the world around us. And we thank you for all the donations come in to help us accomplish your will. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together. Uh, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word. By the power of your Holy Spirit, through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. I, I'm told to make one announcement. A lot of you have been directed to go through the double glass doors over here because we can use that whole building parking lot. It's a lot closer. It's, help, it's easier for the handicap. It's also closer to the elevators. Um, but the other thing is we've been hardening our building for security reasons. Uh, we now have a, a safe place uh, that is if anything ever happens. Uh, we've reconfigured our front office there. We're doing everything we can. Uh, because we know this next year is going to be difficult. But so that's why we're also trying to direct people to come through these other doors rather than through the front door. Be blessed. Go have a break. All right. Are you ready? Is everyone buckled in? Got your shoulder straps on as well? Okay. You take a look at this map here. You'll see at the very bottom in red, it says ancient Edom. Now, Edom refers to Esau, Jacob's brother. And right above it, you'll see uh, a couple of little towns. One of them is called Botsra, and the other one is Petra, okay, or Sela. So, uh, you know, I've been to Petra a couple of times, but it's right next to Botsra. Then you'll see Israel, Jerusalem, the West Bank. Now, here's uh, what I want you to know. Biblical Botsra was the nation's capital of Edom. So it was huge. As a matter of fact, uh, the empire was from about 3,000 years ago. But get a load of this. Archaeologists estimate that as many as 1 million Edomites lived in Botsra. A million. That's a lot of people. Now, the word Botsra means a sheepfold or an enclosure. So think of a sheepfold here and you have an enclosure. That's what the very name Botsra meant. And guess what they had there? Sheep. <laughs> okay. That's probably why they named it Botsra. Now, it was a very pastoral, you know, community. As you, can, as you saw, it was just southeast of the Dead Sea. But listen to this in Isaiah 34, verse 1 and 2. It says, come here, you nations, to hear and hearken, you people. Let the earth hear and all that is therein. Let the world hear and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon how many nations? And his fury against all their armies, he's utterly destroyed them and he has delivered them to the slaughter. Now, how many of you know this is like an end times verse? This is speaking of what's yet to come. Now look at the next verse six of that same chapter. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats. 
with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice where? In Botsra. Okay, and that's why it's filled with the blood of lambs and goats, because that's what is in Botsra. And a great slaughter in the land of Edomia, which is Edom. So he's talking here specifically about a big sacrifice of lambs and goats in the sheepfold. Now look at the next verse eight. It is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. The Bible says that Zion or Jerusalem is gonna be a stumbling block for all nations. And there's this big controversy over Israel, even at this day, but the day of the Lord's vengeance is coming and the year of his redeemed. What day is the day of Lord's vengeance on the biblical calendar? Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Now look at Isaiah 63, 1 through 4. Who is this that is coming from Edom with dyed garments from where? Botra. That's glorious in apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save, wherefore are you red in your apparel? And your garments like him that treads in the wine fat. Now remember, the grapes are harvested in the fall. These events are going to happen in the fall. And it says, I've trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was no one with me. For I will tread them in my anger. I will trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. And I will stain all my remnant uh, raiment because the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed has come. This is what we basically just read, but it adds in. Does everyone see this? Now, look at Revelation 14, 18. Another angel comes out from the altar, which has power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So this, can you see the connections here? These are the grapes, and it's going to happen in the fall, this event. Now, this is fascinating, because look at this in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 4 through 6. This is talking about Yom Kippur. And the priest has to take off his glorious apparel and put on the plain white linen garments. And it says he's to put on the holy linen coat and he shall have the linen breeches on his flesh. He'll be girded with a linen girdle and with a linen miter will he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore, he's to wash his flesh in water and put them on. And he's to take of the congregation of the children of Israel two goats for a sin offering, one ram for a burnt offering, and Aaron will offer the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself. Now, how many of you know, you all tell your kids when you put on their brand new clothing not to go play in the mud? Here these priests have on all white linen garments, and they're splashing blood everywhere doing the sacrifices. They're going to have these white linen garments completely stained with blood. But look at this. It says, <clears throat> back to Leviticus 16, 4 through 6, it says, He will take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats, one ram for the burnt offering, and Aaron will offer the bullock of the sin offering for who? Him. And for who? His house. The day of atonement is not for Gentiles, Yom Kippur is for the nation of Israel. That's why the high priest made atonement for himself. Then he makes it for his house. Then they make it for the nation of Israel. Yom Kippur is not a Gentile feast. It's a Jewish feast. I believe some year on Yom Kippur, Israel realized that Yeshua is the Messiah. It literally will happen on that day, sometime in history. I don't know what year, but that's what that feast is all about. Now look at, we just got done reading in Isaiah, he's got on this garment and it's dyed with blood or the grapes, right? Well, look at Revelation 19. For true and righteous are his judgments. He's judged the great whore, which corrupted the earth with her fornication. And then it says, he has avenged the blood of his servants and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Doesn't that sound like Joseph? Joseph's garment? 
all right? And it's a multicolored garment because it represents all nations. And his name is called the word of God. And then it says the armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses, clothed, what, what were they clothed in? Linen, white and clean. Why? Every Yom Kippur, every Jew puts on white. This is a Yom Kippur event that will happen on Yom Kippur. And out of the mouth goes a sharp sword. We just read about in Isaiah. And the reason is to smite the nations and to rule them with a rod of iron. And what is he treading? The wine press that we just got done reading about in Botsra for the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, now look at Jeremiah 49, 13. When God swears, believe me, it's gonna happen. And he says, I've sworn by myself, says the Lord, that what? Botsra is gonna become a desolation, a reproach, a waste, a curse, and all the cities will be perpetual waste. That has not happened yet. This is a prophecy that's yet to come. Now look at Leviticus 16, 17. When the high priest goes in to make atonement on Yom Kippur, it says there's to be no one in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement, here we go, for himself, for his house, and for the congregation of Israel. That is who Yom Kippur is for. And how many people are supposed to be in the Holy of Holies besides him? Yeah, he's the only one. That's Leviticus. Well, look at Revelation. 15, eight, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues and seven angels were fulfilled. This is Yom Kippur. This is connecting the whole thing back to Leviticus. Now look at Revelation 14, 14 through 16. It says, and I looked. And behold, a white cloud upon the cloud, one sat like the son of man, having on his head a golden crown, in his hand a sharp sickle. So who is this referring to? Yeshua. And then another angel comes out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to the person who sat on the cloud, which is Yeshua. And he says, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in the sickle of the earth, and the earth was reaped. Okay, you don't do a harvest until it's ready to be harvested. But now it's ready to be harvested. Now look at the next verses in 17 through 20. It says another angel comes out of the temple, which is in heaven. And he also had a sharp sickle. This is the second harvest. There's more than one harvest here. This is the second harvest. <clears throat> and it says, he cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle saying, you thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. Okay, Passover was what harvest? Barley harvest. Pentecost is what harvest? Summer harvest. And the fall is the grape harvest. The barley harvest happens in the spring. The summer harvest happens in the summer. And the grape harvest happens in the fall. So this is telling us these events are gonna happen in the fall during the fall feast. And then it says, the angel thrust in his sickle to the earth and gathered the vine of the earth. And it says, this time he cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. So one harvest goes up to the Messiah, the other harvest gets thrown into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden without a city Blood came out of the wine press, even unto the horse's bridle by the space of 1,600 furlongs. You want me to put that in English? Five, five foot deep for 200 miles. Five feet. Five feet deep for 200 miles is the blood. Okay. Now with that, I'm going to jump for a minute to a story that we are encountering in the Torah about Judah and Tamar in Genesis 38, 27 through 29. It says, and it came to pass in the time of Tamar's travail that behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed, one put out his hand and the midwife took it 
and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This is the firstborn. And then it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out. And she said, How have you broken forth? This breach be upon you. Therefore, his name was called Peretz. So what does Peretz mean? A breakthrough, to break forth, a breach. That's why they called him Peretz. Okay. Peretz is a very important person. Very important. Okay, this Judah has a relationship with Tamar unknowingly, and she has two twins, Zerah, which means seed, and Peretz, which means to break forth. All right, now look at this. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17 through 21, the Philistines heard that David was anointed king over Israel, and so all the Philistines came up to basically go to war with David. And David heard about it, and he went down to the hold, and the Philistines came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up to the Philistines? <clears throat> will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go on up. I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. And so David came to Baal, Peretzim. What does that mean? What does Baal mean? Lord. Peretz is singular. Peretzim is plural. It means David came to the Lord of breakthroughs. And David smote them there. And he said, the Lord has broken forth as the breach of waters. There you go, right there on the picture, just as in the Exodus. And he's talking as the breach. The Lord did a big breakthrough just like he did at the Red Sea. And it says, therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Peretzim, the Lord of breakthroughs. And that's why it's there. They left all their idols. They finally got rid of their idols and David burnt them. So this verse means the Lord of breakthroughs. That's what Peretz is. Now, if you look at the book of Ruth, chapter four, verse 18, it says, now these are the generations of who? Peretz, who was the child of Judah. And it lists all of them. And finally it says, and Obed, in verse 22, begat Jesse and Jesse begat who? David. Okay. Peretz is the seventh great grandpa of David. And seven is very significant. Now, I'm going to give you a verse that almost no Christians understand what it means in the Gospels. Listen to Matthew eleven twelve. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent are taking the kingdom of heaven by force. Have you ever heard someone try to interpret that verse? I mean, what? Let me, let me give you again the English equivalent. The Hebrew word for English, uh, the Hebrew word for violence is what? Okay, so let's read it. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers from Hamas and Hamas is going to take heaven by force. How, how, how do you know how stupid that is? Here is the reason why the English Bible is not your best Bible. Plus, when you have a Greek mindset, not a Hebrew mindset, this is how you get such a jumbled mess in English. Let me explain what this verse really is saying. Are you ready? Let's, first, let's set the stage. In Ezekiel 34, 31, God says to Israel, you are my flock, the flock of my pasture are men, and I'm your God, says the Lord. Okay, so the Lord is our shepherd, and we are his flock, right? Okay, so let's come back to the sheepfold. Okay, this is Botsra, and the little gate there is opened up so the sheep can get out. The shepherd guards it right there, and there's all these sheep. How would you like to be penned up all night and have no room to move? What is the first thing you want to do? How many of you have ever been on an airplane and you're trying to get out? I'll just throw this personal story here. I will never forget. I'm on a big airplane and I'm kind of in the back with, 
you know, I mean, it's got a couple hundred people on this plane. Everybody wants to get the heck off of there. It's been like five-hour flight. And everybody, when the plane stops, they start lifting up the luggage thing, getting their luggage out, and there's this, you know what it's like. You just can't move. The lady next to me gets a phone call. She's finally got home. She's going to wait to get home and see her kids. The babysitter tells her on the phone her kids are missing, that they didn't come home, okay? And she has all these people in front of her. She was jumping and leaping over every seat. She didn't care. She is gonna, she's going to go find out. What? Whoa, she was just screaming so mad at this babysitter. Where are my kids? And I mean, can you imagine how crammed that is? She is trying to get out of there. Okay, look at Micah. This is chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. This is the key verse to interpret the Matthew verse. God says, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of you. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of where? Of Botsra, as the flock in the midst of their fold. And then it says that they're going to make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. What does that mean? Well, take a look at my little thing here. Put your, oh, Jill. Oh, I got it. Okay. Ready, drum roll. Okay, so here we are. There's all these sheep. It's been all night long. And they're waiting to get the heck out of there. And morning comes. They want to get the heck out of there. Okay, so here they are. They're jumping and they're playing. Yay! Okay, it says this. The breaker, Peretz, the breaker has come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. And their king is going to pass before them and the Lord at the head of them. So the Lord is the shepherd and the kingdom of heaven is coming. It is going to be so many people that they're going to want to get the heck out of there. So what this is really saying is not the kingdom of heaven isn't suffering violence and the violent are taking it by force. It should read the kingdom of heaven is breaking forth and members of the kingdom are breaking out with the Lord leading them. That's what the Peretz is, the Lord of the breakthroughs. He is because of the multitude of people in the kingdom of God that are being saved and the vast revival that everyone's going to want to get out. And so they're breaking out into the kingdom of God. Now look at Ruth, chapter 1, verse 8 and 10. You all know the story of the book of Ruth. Okay, if you remember, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, what are their names? Not Oprah, Orpah, okay, and Ruth. What do Orpah and Ruth represent Gentiles who've been grafted into Israel, right? That's what the plain meaning of the text is. And so she says to her two daughters-in-law, you go back to your mother's houses. May the Lord be good to you as you have been good to the dead and to me. May the Lord give you rest in the houses of your husbands. And then she gave them a kiss and they were weeping bitterly. And they said to her, no, but we're going to go back with you to your people. Well, what happens then in Ruth 1, 14 and 15? It says, then again, they were weeping. And so what happens? Orpah gives her mother-in-law Naomi, a kiss. But Ruth would not be parted from her. And Naomi said, see, your sister-in-law has what? Has gone back to her people and to her gods. Okay, go back after your sister-in-law. Okay, so who knows what Ruth's name means in Hebrew? Friend. Ruth 
becomes a friend to the Jew, ends up working the harvest, it says, from the barley to the wheat, and ends up bringing forth the Messiah through King David. Okay? Orpah's name means to turn your back on. So here Orpah gives the Jew a Judas kiss and turns her back on her and goes back to her gods. Okay, you all following me? Okay. And then look at Ruth 1, 16 and 17. Ruth said, give up requesting me to go away or to go back without you. For where you go, I will go. Where you take your rest, I will take my rest. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Wherever death comes to you, death will come to me and there will be my last resting place. The Lord do so to me and more if we are parted by anything but death. Okay, look at Ruth 2, 23. Ruth keeps fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest and dwelt there with her mother-in-law. Okay, Ruth and Orpah are Gentiles grafted into the church. Part of the church turns her back on Israel and goes back to her pagan gods. Ruth is the part of the church that works with Israel, works the harvest, and will bring forth the Messiah. Now, get a load of this. Are you ready? Drum roll. Ruth, look at the picture here. I said Orpah means what? The back of the neck. Ruth means friend. Ruth begets David. Orpah begets Goliath. Yes. And so the final battle in history is going to be the Ruth church against the Orpah church. And that is what's going to be this final battle prophetically in the last days. The book of Ruth is all about there's going to be a big division in Christianity that we see right now with the woke church. You have the woke church and then you have the church that supports Israel. And that's going to be the dividing line in the church. The Goliath that we're going to be fighting is going to be the woke church. Something to think about. Now, with that in mind, get a load of this. Oh, I forgot something. Uh, let me get here, I think. Uh, let me go text somebody. Real quick. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, here we go. Oh, uh, book. How to back. Okay. Uh, Geomi, if you can hear me, I'm texting you right now. I have a book that's in my bag I need you to bring for me. Okay, before I go there, let me see where I'm at. Yeah, let me see. Okay. Just as Jacob and Esau were brothers, right? They're brothers. And there was a constant war between them. Amalek was Esau's grandson. And Peretz was Jacob's grandson. Just like David and Goliath, okay? Here we also have Amalek and Peretz. Now, listen to 1 John 2, 18 and 19. Little children, it's the last time. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is gonna come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. The problem is always within the church. That's where the tares and the wheat grow together. The division is always gonna be within the body. The enemy isn't necessarily those outside, it's those that have come inside. Just like the problem, I'm all for immigrants that come in legally, but we have opened the, with the doors to the terrorists. And they're now inside. My goodness. 
We don't need the Trojan horse. We're inviting them all in and paying them. Okay. Listen to Matthew 13, 24 through 30. Another parable put he forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man which sowed good seed in the field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said to him, sir, don't you know, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did these tares come from? And he said, an enemy has done this. And the servant said, well, do you want us to go out and gather the tares? And he said, no, that's why you gather up the tares. You root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. In the time of harvest, I will tell the reapers, gather first the tares and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay, the tares don't bear fruit and they stay perpendicular. The wheat bear fruit and they bow. That's how they know to separate the tares from the wheat at the time. The tares are like full of pride. Now, but notice it says, gather the tares first. And then it says, gather the wheat and put them in my barn. Where's God's barn? God's barn is the temple mount. Remember, it used to be the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Okay. This, uh, I have a whole nother theology I'll go into later. But look at this. I'm almost done. Genesis 42, 8, back to Joseph. Joseph knew his brethren, but they didn't know him. Why? It's the same reason the Jews don't recognize Yeshua today. It's because we're presenting an Egyptian Jesus. We're not presenting a Hebrew Yeshua. And then we wonder why they don't recognize him. In John 1, 10 and 11, he was in the world. The world was even made by him. And the world didn't even know him. He came into his own and his own received him not. Now, going back to the Torah portion, listen to Genesis 42, 21. Here they said one to another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother. And we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. This is why the distress has come upon us. And then in verse 16, Judah says, what will we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how will we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. And remember, they didn't even sell them. They didn't even kill them. And yet they are taking responsibility for their thoughts. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and also with whom the cup is found. Now, therefore, I pray you, let your servant abide instead of the lad of because they find out it's Benjamin and Judah's all upset. So he says, let Benjamin go and I'll be your servant. For how will I go to my father and the lad not be with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that comes on my father. Well, look at Genesis 45, one through five. This is gonna be so mind blowing. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood behind him. And he cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him. This event happened on Yom Kippur. This is a Yom Kippur event, and I can prove that biblically. It says, while Joseph made himself known to his brethren, he wept aloud and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brethren, I'm Joseph, does my father yet live? And his brethren couldn't answer him because they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, come here, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I'm Joseph, your brother whom you sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves that you sold me here, God did not send me, God did send me here to preserve life. Now, I'm gonna to prove to you this was a Yom Kippur event, biblically. Look at this in Genesis 41, one, which we'll be talking about. I remember the story of the butcher and the baker and one gets killed and the other one survives, but he forgets to tell the king about Joseph's dream for two years. Now, when you go back to the story, it says at the end of two full years, Full years are Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. So when it says at the end of two full years, it's telling you it is Rosh Hashanah. Genesis 41, one, it came to pass at the end of two full years, Pharaoh dreamed and behold, he was standing by the river. You all know the dream. But now look what happens. In Genesis 45, six and seven, there's been two years of famine in the land and yet there are five more years in which there will be neither earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity there to save your lives by a great deliverance. Well, guess what? The yeah, seven years of prosperity went from Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah for seven years. And the seven years of famine went from Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. And it's been two full years, which means it's back to Rosh Hashanah. And what's 10 days after Rosh Hashanah, but Yom Kippur. I believe some year on Yom Kippur, 
and it could be the second year of the tribulation as it was the second year of famine, that Messiah is going to reveal himself. Something to think about. <clears throat> okay, now I have six more minutes. I've timed this really well. I am going to tell you a Hanukkah story from one of the worst Nazi Germany camps. <clears throat> this is Bergen-Belsen. You see that on the map up there, Bergen-Belsen? This is Germany. And it's a night in Hanukkah. And I'm going to read this little story to you. It says, in Bergen-Belsen, on the eve of Hanukkah, a selection took place. Early in the morning, three German commandants meticulously dressed in their festive black uniforms and invisibly high spiritually dressed in their festive, uh, meticulously dressed in their festive black uniforms and invisibly high spirits entered the men's barracks. Here's the men's barracks. And they ordered the men to stand at the foot of their three-tiered bunks. And then the selection began. One of the three commandants lifted his index finger in his snow white glove and pointed in the direction of one pale face while his mouth pronounced the death sentence with one single word, come. The random selection went on inside the barracks and the brutal massacre continued outside of the barracks until sundown when the Nazi black angels of death departed and they left behind heaps of hundreds of tortured and twisted bodies and then Hanukkah began. It came to Bergen-Belsen. Uh, Bergen it was time to kindle the Hanukkah lights. A jug of oil was nowhere to be found. No candle was in sight. And the Hanukkah belonged to the distant past. This is what they had remembered. But now it says, a wooden clog, the shoe of one of the inmates, became the Hanukkah. Strings that were pulled from the concentration camp uniform became the wick. And the black camp shoe polish is where they got the pure oil. And not far from the heaps of bodies, the living skeletons assembled to participate in the kindling of the Hanukkah lights. Uh, one rabbi lit the first light and chanted the first two blessings in his pleasant voice, and the festive melody was filled with sorrow and pain. When he was about to recite the third blessing, he stopped and he turned his head and he looked around as if he were searching for something. Uh, he was about to say the Shehekianu, which is thankful, God, that we have arrived at this season. And he doesn't know if he can say thank you, God. But immediately he turned his face back to the quivering small lights and in a strong, reassuring, comforting voice, he chanted the third blessing. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has kept us alive, preserved us, and enabled us to reach this season. And as soon as the rabbi had finished the ceremony of kindling the lights, one man elbowed his way, elbowed his way to the rabbi and said, I can understand your need to light Hanukkah candles in these wretched times. I can even understand the historical note of the second blessing. But the fact that you recited the third blessing is beyond me. How could you thank God and say, blessed are you, Lord or God, King of the universe, who's kept us alive and preserved us and enabled us to reach this season. For this you are thankful to God. For this you praise the Lord. This you call keeping us alive. And the rabbi says, you're 100% right. When I reached the third blessing, I also hesitated and asked myself, what should I do with this blessing? But just as I was turning my head, I noticed that behind me, there was a throng of people, a large crowd of living Jews, their faces expressing faith, devotion, and concentration as they were listening to the rite of the kindling of the Hanukkah lights. And I said to myself, if God blessed be he has such a nation that at times like this, when during the lighting of the Hanukkah lights, they see in front of them the heaps of bodies of their beloved fathers, brothers, and sons, and death is looking from every corner. In spite of all that, they can stand here in throngs and with devotion listening to the Hanukkah blessing, who wrought miracles for our fathers in the days of old at this season. If indeed I was blessed to see such a people with so much faith and fervor that I am under a special obligation to recite this third blessing. 
I mean, here are people who have everything imaginable, horrible that's going on, but they're still going to honor God. Now, in case you didn't know, Matthew 24, which is all about end times, is Hanukkah happening again. And if you don't know Hanukkah, you don't realize that. But concerning David, again, Matthew 1.17 and Peretz, all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations from David to the exile of Babylon, 14 generations, from the carrying away of Babylon to the Messiah, 14. And why does it say 14? Because David's name in Hebrew has a numerical value of 14. This whole thing is saying the Messiah is born, the Messiah is born, the Messiah is born. But in English, you don't catch that. But every Jew who reads this knows it's saying David, David, David. This is why we need to have and take another look at what's going on. Amen? All right, let's stand.